Good morning. A little high. Our littlest ones are dismissed for children's church, so charge out of the room. I want to uh, thank all of you who prayed for me uh, on my trip to Emmaus Bible College in Dubuque, Iowa last week. It is great to be home. I certainly probably need to turn it down just a little bit more, Sam. Thanks. I called uh, Brother Oren last Sunday before the Super Bowl, and he says, it's 70 degrees here in Lafayette. It was 16 in Dubuque. Thursday morning, three days ago, uh, before I left uh, Dubuque, it was minus 12. And so it snowed for 24 hours last weekend. So uh, it's great to be back here with you. I knew I was on the right plane uh, to Lafayette uh, on uh, Thursday night when... Uh, Half the guys on the plane had caps and jackets with uh, hunting fatigues, looked like they had come out of uh, Duck Dynasty. Uh, please keep uh, this intern program in your prayers. I met with over a dozen students at Emmaus Bible College this last week, talked to many more, but met with 12, and uh, talked to them about coming here. And what this is about is a relationship. And so uh, I have tried to build relationships uh, with some of the young people from the past and met some new ones. Uh, one couple had a baby since uh, I was there last. Another young man has gotten engaged uh, since I was there. He would love for me to come for the wedding this uh, next summer. I'm not sure how, if that'll work or not. But uh, anyway, please be in prayer that the Lord would bring the young people here to serve with us that he would want. Uh, and it's about what he's doing in their life, uh, their lives, what he's doing in our lives. So uh, it was exciting to be there. And uh, I'll, I'll show you some pictures next week. I just ran out of time. I uh, got in so late to be able to do the photos. So I'll show those to you next week. We are now studying the last act in the Gospel of Mark. And the last week in Jesus' life before his death and resurrection. On Sunday of what we call Holy Week, what we would also call Palm Sunday, Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey fulfilling prophecy about Israel's Messiah King. On Monday of that week, Jesus came back to the capital city of Israel and he put a stop to a sacrilegious, crooked business that was going on in the temple complex. And then on Tuesday, Jesus came back a second time to Jerusalem where, or actually it would be a third time, where representatives from the religious establishment confronted him. Except for Jesus' trial three days later on what we would call Good Friday, this was the most dramatic confrontation of Jesus' life with this uh, religious elite. A public battle of words and wits between Jesus on the Messiah on one hand and the highest religious leaders in ancient Israel on the other. There are some really cool challenges in this passage we're going to look at today. So, uh, as is our custom, let's take just a moment and talk to God and ask for His help to understand this passage. Would you bow your heads with me, please? Father, we love you. Uh, it's wonderful to live here in a warm, friendly uh, city like Lafayette with great food. But Lord, our greatest blessings are that we belong to you. You have revealed yourself to us. We can know you. And in this next few minutes, Father, I pray that you would illuminate our minds, open our hearts through the power of your Holy Spirit, and may we each come away with some word, some message from you that we can take home today, that we can use this next week both in our own lives and in the lives of everybody that we touch. And we pray that you will do this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's begin reading in Mark chapter 11, verse 27. They, referring to Jesus and His disciples, came again to Jerusalem. Remember, this is Tuesday. As He was walking in the temple complex, this enormous courtyard, the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders came and asked Him, By what authority... Are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority to do these things? Jesus' bold, fearless act the day before of cleansing the temple complex was the final straw that precipitated this conflict, this controversy, this crisis with the religious hierarchy. Thanks to Jesus, the Jewish mafia bosses, we'd call them, had lost their illegal but very profitable business in the temple. If they didn't do something to stop Jesus once and for all, they'd lose their credibility with the Jewish 
people, they would lose their power with the Romans, and of course, they would never get this business back going again. They would have arrested Jesus on the spot when he did that on Monday, but they were afraid of the people. Jesus was just too popular, and they thought it might cause a riot. So as Jesus and his disciples returned the next day, Tuesday, to this temple complex, they publicly accost him with representatives from the three factions that made up the Sanhedrin, which was Israel's 70-member Supreme Court. And here's the three groups, the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders that made up that 70-person, 70 70-man, 70 we would say, Supreme Court of Israel. This was a turning point, a critical juncture in Jesus' life and ministry. If you recall, back in Jesus' first prophecy of His death, Jesus predicted that these three groups, the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders, would join together to put Him to death. Three days after this, on Good Friday, these are the guys who at His Jewish trial would be His very um, aggressive district attorneys to execute Him. These guys were so desperate to maintain their authority that they demanded to know two things from Jesus. They devised two questions that they thought would back Jesus into a corner. First question, by what authority are you doing these things? That these things, clearing out the temple on Monday. Today we would ask something like this, what right do you have to do this? They were asking, what rabbi school did you graduate from, Jesus? What university granted you a degree? Show us and will be impressed. Second question, who gave you this authority? They're basically asking here, do you have human authority or divine authority? Show us your spiritual credentials. Show us your license to operate in God's name. The purpose of these questions was not information, but incrimination. These religious big shots were smug as they asked these questions. They felt assured that they had Jesus over a barrel, that they had him caught on the two horns of a dilemma. They hadn't given him permission, humanly, to clear out the temple. So he had no human authority, they thought. If Jesus answered their question honestly, I don't have any human authority. Or even if he lied, of course Jesus wouldn't lie. Either way, they knew that they could publicly humiliate him in front of the people. Discredit him, since he wasn't authorized to act. But if Jesus claimed divine authority, that would be tantamount to confessing he was the Messiah. Then they could charge him with blasphemy, turn him over to the Romans, accusing him of leading an insurrection against Rome. So they thought they had him caught. But Jesus was their worst nightmare. Barring a debate tactic from their own rabbis, Jesus asked a counter question that backed them into a corner. Let's look at what he said. Verse 29, Jesus said to them, I will ask you one question, Greek literally one word, one logos. Then answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I am doing these things. Was John's baptism, talking about John the Baptist, was his baptism from heaven or from men? Answer me. This is the first of several traps that the Sanhedrin laid for Jesus and snares they set for him on that first day that he confronted them. But instead of defending himself, instead of debating with them, Jesus takes the offensive. Don't miss what Jesus is saying here. Jesus is not being irrelevant. He's not being evasive. He's not trying to dodge the question or change the subject like a raccoon jumping into a stream to shake the hounds on his scent. What did Jesus' baptism have to do with Jesus, or what did John's baptism have to do with Jesus' authority? Let's see. Let's go back to the beginning chapter of Mark at verse 9 in Mark 1. In those days, way back at the beginning of his ministry, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized in the Jordan by John. As soon as Jesus came up out of the water, he saw the heavens being torn open and the Holy Spirit descending to him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, God the Father, you are my beloved son. I take delight in you. At Jesus' baptism, John the Baptist, a prophet sent from God, as well as God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, all three put their public seal of approval on Jesus and his ministry. 
Jesus' authority came both from John, a man on earth, and from two persons in the triune God in heaven. Jesus' counter question tells the Jewish Sanhedrin point blank. If they want to know where Jesus gets his authority from, then they need to decide where John got his authority from. A decision about John would be a decision about Jesus. So here's the two sides of it. If John's authority to baptize Jesus to approve of his ministry was solely from men, that is fully explainable by empirical science, then these religious leaders might have had a right to question or doubt Jesus' authority. But if John's baptism was from God in heaven, then that's where Jesus also got his authority. So the guys heard this two sides of the dilemma, so they had to huddle for a moment. Let's look at what they said. Verse 31, these three groups began to argue among themselves. By the way, this is a Rembrandt sketch, and it's very interesting. He has them sort of huddling in different groups, which may have been actually what happened. They began to argue among themselves. If we say from heaven, Jesus will say, then why did you not believe John? But if we say from men, they were afraid of the crowd because everyone thought that John was a genuine prophet. So, they answered Jesus, we don't know. And Jesus said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. <laughs> these guys plan backfired. They got caught in their own trap. Ouch. The Greek verb here, argue among themselves, is used seven times in Mark's gospel and always in places where people are trying to evade, wiggle out of Jesus' words or claims. And it's right here. They had all the answers until Jesus beat them at their own game. And then what do they claim? We don't know. Their problem wasn't ignorance. It was unbelief. They did know the answer, and they were not willing to admit it. When have you heard that before? When their chemistry experiment blew up in their faces to keep from getting egg on their faces, these big wigs took the refuge that all humble people love to hide in. We're going to keep an open mind about it. We're going to suspend judgment for now. We're agnostics. To save face, these pious phonies took the fifth. Why? They were cowards. They feared the truth even more than they feared the people. And so Jesus has brilliantly turned the tables on these religious windbags. Notice what Jesus does here. He doesn't appeal to any human authority. Not the rabbi schools, not Jewish tradition, not the temple, not even the Torah. Jesus goes beyond the Roman might that was in right next door to the temple in the Fortress Antonio. Jesus draws the line in the sand between heaven and earth, between God and man. Notice that Jesus' demand for an answer, when he said, answer me, that implies that his authority is so high that he doesn't stand under Israel's Supreme Court. He stands over it. He stands above it. During Jesus' three to four year short ministry, apart from his miracles, the thing that impressed people the most, the thing that left the most lasting impression on both his disciples and his detractors was his sovereign magisterial authority. Jesus always had authority over everything. People, nature, disease, demons, even death. Don't miss this, please. Where is Jesus right now? He is in Israel's most authoritative city, Jerusalem. He's in the most authoritative sacred site in the country, the temple. And he's standing in front of representatives of the most authoritative body in Judaism, the Sanhedrin. And he demonstrates his supreme authority as God in the flesh. His very authority that they challenge is the same authority that he's using to answer them here. Friend, don't make the mistake that these guys made. There are times when we do need to be open-minded. 
when we need to be fair and balanced, when we need to say the words we don't know. And that's when there's no clear answer in the Bible about something. In Mark chapter 13, we're going to get to it in about three weeks. That's a chapter where Jesus talks the whole chapter about prophecy. And you're, I may disappoint some of you, but when I share that chapter here, I'm going to tell you I don't have all the answers about what it means, about the sequence of events, or how much of it was filled in the past, how much of it will fill the future, because I don't know. So chapter 13 of, of, of Mark, that's one where I'm going to say that to you. Chapter 16, when we end this series, this whole issue of the Greek manuscripts in the end of Mark, I'm going to give you my theory, I'm going to give you my opinion, but I don't know the answer. But when it comes to who Jesus is, to his claims, it is the worst thing to plead ignorance. When it comes to accepting Jesus' claims to be Messiah, we sang about him as Messiah, as his claims to be God, there's no middle ground. If we are not honest with ourselves about Jesus, we can't be honest with him. If we are unwilling to commit ourselves to Jesus, just like here, he will be unwilling to commit himself to us. It's a two-way street. I want to give you a very simple outline of our passage today. First, Israel's leaders challenged the authority of Israel's Messiah. That's the end verses of chapter 11. Then Israel's Messiah challenges the authority of Israel's religious leaders. The first 12 verses of the next chapter, which we will now look at. So Jesus seems to have evaded their question, but now he's about to really answer it. But he answers it by telling a story. Let's look at these verses. Chapter 12, verse 1. Then Jesus began to speak to them in parables. It's been a while since we heard one of those. A man planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a pit for a wine press, and built a watchtower. Sounds like we're back in Sunday school for those of you who are in the adult Sunday school with Gideon and the wine press. Then the man released it to the tenant farmers and went away. At harvest time, he sent a slave to the farmers to collect some of the fruit of the vineyard from the farmers as rent. But they took him, beat him, and sent him away empty-handed. Again, he sent another slave to them, and they hit him on the head and treated him shamefully. Then he sent another slave, and they killed that one. He also sent, so sent many others. They beat some and they killed some. This is Jesus' only major parable in Mark's gospel outside of chapter 4, where, remember we, where he told those parables? The parable of the sower and the seed. Here Jesus tells a story that secular records and rabbinic literature of the time confirms is a very accurate description of three classes of people that existed in the socioeconomic system of the first century. There were rich absentee landlords or landowners. That's one class, often Gentiles. And they sent slaves as middlemen or bill collectors who traveled into Israel to collect the rent from these tenant farmers. Tenant farmers leased the land, they farmed it, and then they paid for their rent of living there with some of the produce. They kept some, and then they gave some, or were supposed to give some, to these bill collectors, to these slaves to give back to the landlord. So three classes, rich landowners outside the country, then the slaves who collected the uh, rent, and then the tenant farmers who worked the land. Now I want to show you some photographs from Israel of these very things. So <clears throat> this is a modern farm, and I want to show you some parts of it. Israel is one of the rockiest places in the world, and so it's, did I, okay, go ahead. I must have done that, sorry. Um, it's very easy to build stone fences, both for your livestock and for your crops, because all you have to do is just gather up a bunch of stones. So these stone fences are still here today. Let's keep going. This is a um, wine press hewn out of rock. And then you notice there's a little channel. And let's look down in this right here in the next picture. 
And this is the vat where the wine, the juice, would have been collected. Of course, then it was put in skin bottles of the time and left to ferment. Let's keep going. This was the watchtower that uh, you could actually sleep in. You could store produce in. And also, you could look out to make sure nobody was going to steal something, especially during harvest. One more. And there still are these migrant workers, many of them Palestinians, many of them Arabs, who work uh, in these little tracts of land there in Israel. Is that our last one? I think so. Yeah. So we have the passage back up there again. So uh, it's fascinating to see after 2,000 years, much of that still hasn't changed from the Bible. This is yet another parable Jesus tells from the soil, from everyday life. But this particular parable recapitulates, it retells all of Israel's history. Who's the man in the story? God. The vineyard, the nation of Israel. The slaves that are sent, God's prophets. The tenant farmers, in this case, the religious leaders who were confronting Jesus. Let's look at a verse in the Old Testament that gives us insight into this same parable. Jeremiah 25, verse 4. The Lord sent all his servants, the prophets, to you, God speaking to Israel, time and time again, but you have not obeyed or even paid attention. In Jesus' parable, the farmers pay their rent not in crops, but in blows, with escalating violence with each of the slaves that comes to collect the rent. This is like what we've seen in the news recently as we followed the horrible series of events with ISIS, their violence against soldiers, against journalists, has gotten progressively worse. Same thing in the parable. Each slave was treated worse, the next one worse, until finally, who got the worst of it? The son of the owner. Let's look at that in verse 6. The owner still had one to send, a beloved son. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But those tenant farmers said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they seized him, killed him, and threw him out of the vineyard, apparently without even an honorable burial. Therefore, Jesus asks, What will the owner, notice the word, do? What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the farmer and give the vineyard to others. The one son here, this one, is compared to the one word earlier. One word about the one son. The Greek word for owner here, we've seen it many times, kurios, could also be translated Lord, one of God's names, to confirm just who the owner of the parable is. It's God. And we've already seen the Father's beloved Son, twice in Mark. Let's look at those again. Mark chapter 1, verse 11. And a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved Son, the Father talking directly to His Son. I take delight in you. And Mark 9, 7, at the transfiguration, a cloud appeared overshadowing Jesus and the three disciples. And a voice came from the cloud once again. This is my beloved Son. Listen to Him. Let me ask you a question. What wealthy landowner in his right mind would send his beloved son, his only son, to face such wicked lowlifes who had done all these terrible things to his slaves? Do you realize that would be worse than President Obama sending his two precious daughters, Sasha and Malia, to negotiate with the ISIS bad guys? As I prepared this slide yesterday, I felt very sad about this photo. Brothers and sisters, how many of you ever pray for our president? How many of you ever pray for his daughters? I know that some of you have a lot of trouble with this guy, so do I. But we need to pray for him and for his family. 
We often say that a child reflects on their parents. We often judge parents by their children, but you know that sword cuts two ways. It's also true that a parent can reflect on their child. Let's not judge children for what their parents do. This was driven home to me some years ago when I met a very distinguished police officer in the city of Houston, Texas. And some of you know that my dad was a police officer in Houston. And my dad had such a notorious reputation on the police force there in Houston, which is one of the roughest in the whole country, that when this man said, you're Frank Carmichael, is your dad Bill Carmichael? And when the man found out who I was, this officer turned away from me, would not shake my hand, would not even speak to me, judging me for what my father had done. We need to pray for everyone, especially those who are in positions of authority, because many times God can do a work in their children's lives in the center of all that power that, well, God can do anything, can He? But you know, there's another dimension to this. Who are the verses about? God the Father and God the Son. We often talk so much about Jesus. God the Father is reflected in His Son, His beloved Son. Think about that this afternoon and this week. That it's not just Jesus reflecting on the Father. It's the Father reflecting on Jesus when he was here on this earth. Why would any man in his right mind send his son to such evil people? But this is Jesus' whole point of the story. This is all of Israel's and world history summed up, leading up to why God sent his only begotten son, the Messiah. Jesus didn't come because we deserved him, but because we needed him. And because God loved us. Let's look at the greatest verse in the Bible, John 3, 16. For God loved the world in this way. He gave His one and only Son, His beloved Son, so that everyone who believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. This is God's heart for rebellious, sinful people. Not just Israel, but all people, including you and me. The question I would ask you as I often do, have you believed in God's one and only beloved Son as your Savior, your Messiah and God? Believe and trust in Him today, if you never have, to receive His gift of eternal life. Do you realize that a big reason why it is so serious to reject Jesus is because when we reject Jesus, we are also rejecting His Father. Please notice a couple of things in this passage as we go on. As long as God sent his slaves, the prophets, he was just sending ambassadors and representatives. But when he sent his son, his heir, God himself was coming in the person of his son. The son wasn't a rep. The son was coming with all the father's power and authority. The words of these men in the parable... Remind you of any words in the Old Testament? Who else said these? Joseph's brothers. When they saw Joseph coming, favored by his father, beloved by his father Jacob, let's kill him. Same words, actually, in the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Very same words as we see here. These wicked farmers didn't kill the son because they didn't know him. They killed him because they knew who he was, which makes their, their crime all the more egregious. Ladies and gentlemen, here is the epitome and the essence of all sin from the beginning of time. This is what sin really looks like unmasked like the Phantom of the Opera. Human history is the sordid record of how human beings have attempted to rid the universe of God. If humanity could just dispense with God, if we could just dispose of Him, then we'd get to be God, right? Or so we think. These religious zealots were so desperate to hold on to their petty power and position that they would rather die than give it up. 
They would rather die than admit the truth about who Jesus was. And so what did God do? He says, 40 years later, you're, you're going to get your wish. Because this is Jesus' prophecy in verse 9 of what would happen to the nation of Israel 40 years later when the Romans marched in, swept into Palestine, destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, crucified or exiled the Jews. We'll look at more of that in chapter 13. The others here. Who are the others? The Gentiles. You and me. Through the gospel. But I think also repentant Israel in the future when they do finally embrace their Messiah. All through Mark, we have seen a theme. Remember the very first sermon I preached to you? The theme of the Messiah as God's secret agent. Up till now, Jesus has carefully guarded his secret identity, who he really is. When people find it out, he tells them to keep it quiet. But now with this parable, Jesus begins, and notice he's in control, he begins to reveal who he really is. Earlier in chapter 4, Jesus told that the purpose of his parables was to reveal truth to his disciples and conceal truth from his opponents. Now, in these last days before his death, this parable is designed to unveil who he is. Let's look at verse 10. Jesus says, haven't you read this scripture from the Old Testament? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This came from where? From whom? This came from the Lord. And I've always loved this phrase, and is wonderful in our eyes. This is a quotation from Psalm 118, verses 22 and 23. It has a double fulfillment. First, believing Israel one day will become God's cornerstone, rejected by the nations, rescued by the Messiah, strategically placed by God in His kingdom building. But the final and ultimate fulfillment of this psalm is Jesus the Messiah. He is the cornerstone, rejected, killed, cast out by evil men, but, and here's the prophecy, resurrected and exalted by God in this age, exalted in the coming kingdom age. Now, different Bible translations, if you look at one you might have open, this word for stone is translated different ways. It could be the cornerstone of a foundation like this that goes down below the ground. It could be the capstone of a column. It could be this, and what's it called? I've got to look at my notes. Very good. Keystone of an arch. Good for you. Uh -huh. That's A+. Plus. Keystone of the arch, capstone, cornerstone. We're not sure. The Jews, the Romans, the Greeks built all of these. It doesn't matter. The, most in, the, the key idea here is Jesus is the most important stone in the building. He's the most important person in our lives. <laughs> That's the point of the psalm. It's the point of the parable. Oh, it's great I have somebody here to help me. Oh, by the way, let's go one more photo. In, near the city of Nazareth in Israel, they've actually found a stone that was quarried from the first century that's been marred. It was, it was quarried out but just left there. What a great illustration of this very verse. Let's go back to verse 12 again. Here's the conclusion. Because they knew Jesus had said this parable against them, they were looking for a way to arrest him. But what? They were afraid of the crowd. Bullies to Jesus, but confronted with the people, they were cowards. So they left him and went away for a few minutes. These guys got the point. They understood that Psalm 118 was about the Messiah. So they had no doubt whom Jesus was claiming to be. This is the third time since Jesus cleansed the temple the day before on Monday that it says that they were afraid of the people. Some leaders, weren't they? Think about this with me. Jesus' parable here echoes Nathan's parable to King David in the Old Testament. Think about the comparisons. Jesus' parable, Mark 12. Nathan's parable in 2 Samuel 12. Interesting, both 12. In both parables, the object of the parable in telling it was to trick the listener and get him to sympathize with the one who had lost something that was loved. In Nathan's story, it was the poor man, remember, who had lost his lamb that the rich man killed. 
In Jesus' story, it's a rich man who loses his son who's killed. But the difference, David repented, and these religious leaders did not. They simply grew more determined to do away with Jesus. And Mark's irony here is rich. Because what are these desperate, despicable men doing? They are beginning to act like the very tenant farmers in the parable. Jesus has no more than said it, and they're beginning to act just like the people that he talked about. The hearts of these religious mugwumps could not have been any harder because they missed the whole point of what Jesus was saying. They knew the Old Testament. Let's look at the last verses of their Old Testament. The Hebrew Bible is arranged differently than ours. The Hebrew Bible, let's move forward, ends with 2 Chronicles chapter 36 and some of the last verses. Look at what it says. But Yahweh, the God of their ancestors, sent word against them by the hand of his messengers, his prophets, sending them time and time again. Why? Because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they kept ridiculing God's messengers, despising his words and scoffing at his prophets until the Lord's wrath was so stirred up against his people that there was no remedy. Some diseases get so far out of control that they cannot be cured. And one of those brothers and sisters is a spiritual disease called a rebellious, sinful heart. In spite of all the negativity and spite of these leaders against Jesus in this passage, I don't want you to go home thinking of the negative. I want you to go home listening to Jesus' own sweet voice. Give the punchline of the parable. Let's look at it one more time. Mark 12, 10. Haven't you read the scripture? If Jesus asked you that question, have you read the scripture? Christian, the stone that the builders rejected, that's Jesus, has become the cornerstone. The one that people said wasn't important, didn't matter, he's the most important in God's mind. This came from the Lord and is wonderful in our eyes. I hope that you feel Jesus is wonderful. One of the things that I really loved about going to Emmaus last week was the large number of young people there who love Jesus. That is important. And I prayed for them, as I pray for you, that you will take, whether you're young or older, that you will take that love for the Lord, that feeling that He is wondrous and wonderful, with you all the days of your life until the day you die. Man's plots cannot trump God's ultimate purposes. Even murdering God's son doesn't thwart God's plans for a minute. The schemes of man, God not only foresees them, God includes them in his grand design to save the world by means of his son's death and resurrection. And it's all for his glory. Think about what this passage would have meant to the church in Rome, that beleaguered church that was suffering Nero's insane persecutions, how much hope would this have been? They too were rejected, cast out, but they were on the winning side, and Jesus reminds them of that. And this gives hope to us. Our world, brothers and sisters, is being besieged more and more by the forces of darkness. But it's also true in our daily lives. No matter what God permits in your life and mine, we can trust Him to work it out for His ultimate good through His beloved Son, the cornerstone. And as a further encouragement to us all, please remember the flip side of these bad tenant farmers. Each of us are also stewards of everything that God gives us. And each of us if we just keep on keeping on, if we just keep being faithful in our daily task, whether it's flying a helicopter or taking care of a baby, whether it's working your job or cutting your yard, if we just continue to be faithful and bear fruit, no matter how small or how slow, our true owner and master will richly reward us someday soon when he comes back to take us to himself. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this amazing passage and it is wonderful because it's about you it's about your son and lord help us to take these things very seriously because you do and we know that you give us the power to do that 
I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.